All right, folks, so if you look at the second annotation or the second headnote, uh, let's begin reading here. So the mere fact that a meeting was considered uh, but never occurred should alert you to the enormous power wielded by the U.S. government at the end of World War II and that the government was maneuvering on a global playing field. And by meeting, I'm referring to a meeting um, that the U.S. is going to hold with Vietnam and France, uh, basically for the U.S. to decide what was going to happen if they're going to get their independence or not. And again, that shows you how much power the U.S. had at the end of World War II. So U.S. policymakers did not decide the Vietnam question solely, if at all, on issues of morality. As historian uh, Gabriel Kolko writes in The Roots of American Foreign Policy, at no time did the desires of the Vietnamese themselves assume a role in the shaping of U.S. policy towards Vietnam. All right, so basically it was more or less up to the United States if France uh, went back into Vietnam or not. Next paragraph. Accordingly, instead of supporting the Republic, the West, that is the U.S., recognized French claims. Uh, following World War II and the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence, England occupied the southern part of Indochina and then turned it back to the French. Nationalist China, uh, this was still under Chiang Kai-shek, this is before the Communist Revolution, remember, uh, they occupied the northern part of Indochina, and the U.S. persuaded China to turn that back to the French. As Ho Chi Minh told an American journalist, quote, we apparently stand quite alone, we shall have to depend on ourselves, close quote. Between October 1945 and February 1946, Ho Chi Minh wrote eight letters to President Truman, reminding him of the self-determination promises the Allied nations made regarding colonies. One of the letters was sent both to Truman and the UN, and here's the text of par partial text of the letter. I wish to invite attention of your excellency for strictly humanitarian reasons to the following matter. Two million Vietnamese died of starvation during the winter of 1944 and spring 1945 because of uh, the starvation policy of French who seized and stored and totally controlled all available rice. Three fourths of cultivated land was flooded in summer of 1945, which was followed by a severe drought of normal harvest five sixths was lost. Many people are starving unless great world powers and international relief organizations bring us immediate assistance. We face imminent catastrophe. And that's the end of this excerpt. So even though Vietnam was free from foreign domination for the first time in its modern history, even though it was very united and and the U.S. was in a position to end 100 years of French domination in Vietnam, Truman never replied to any of Ho Chi Minh's eight letters. Instead, the U.S. chose to ultimately contribute $2 billion to the French effort to reconquer Vietnam. So let's get to uh, the second excerpt from Vietnam, a TV history. I already have it queued up. Ho oh, appealed to President Harry Truman, but he would probably have accepted anyone's support. Those are the eight letters. Truman did not respond to Ho's letters. He had been in office only four months in August 1945 and had not had time to formulate a policy on Indochina. There was quite a division in the State Department over Indochina. Both the Far Eastern office and the European office were in complete agreement that we wanted a strong France recovered in Europe the, from the trauma of uh, uh, Vichy and the defeat in the war. And the, but the European division felt the, to help get the French back on their feet, uh, we should go along with practically anything that the French wanted. Uh, so they wanted a strong France, and in large part that was the Cold War, the Cold War lens again. Uh, one of the things the French said in the United States was, if, if our economy is fledgling, if you don't help us, we fear that the communist presence in France will grow. I mean, at this point, when World War II ends, uh, uh, France, their government was one, thir one third were members of the Communist Party of France. So their argument was, if you don't help us uh, recolonize Vietnam and, and there's more of a, an influx of, of cash and the economy improves, uh, we're afraid that one third is going to become a larger number, a greater number. By late 1946, Ho Chi Minh's government was forced out of Hanoi, 
out of the cities. The first Vietnam War had started. So again, helping out France in, in many in the U.S. government's eyes was an effort to stave off communist presence in France. The French were confident that they could wipe out Jop's ragtag army quickly. They were a modern army with modern weapons, most bought with U.S. aid. The Viet Minh had widespread support from the peasants. I heard about Uncle Ho, who fought for the rights of the peasants and the workers. So as a peasant who had suffered a lot, I realized that the only correct thing for me to do was to follow the same path. At first, we did not have any weapons except for bamboo spears. But in the northern part of our country, they were producing arms. I was appointed to go there to report on the situation in the south. Uncle Ho told me that he carried the south in the depth of his heart. And I should tell him what we needed so that the central government could supply us to fight the French and drive them out of the country. So Ho Chi Minh at this point, geographically speaking, had more of a presence in northern Vietnam, um, and the French had more of a presence in the southern Vietnam. Technically still, they were still one nation of Vietnam. It was not yet partitioned into north and south Vietnam. That was not until 54. I replied that we needed guns. Uncle Ho said that the central government could only give us so many guns because they did not have many. The main thing, he said, was to capture the enemy's guns and use these guns against them. The French bogged down in a quicksand war. Again and again they declared an area pacified only to find it slipping back into Viet Minh control. The guerrillas seemed to be everywhere and nowhere. In the early 50s, the United States had a concept of communism, international communism, as a hard monolithic block. Monolithic meaning the U.S. that they were all acting together as one entity. Of China and Russia with no crevices in it that was seeking to expand and gain a dominant position in the world. Again, that's that oversimplified comic book, comic book version of, of it. In Europe, they had taken over Eastern Europe, pushed into Czechoslovakia, and in Southeast Asia, an area in which we had interest, they seemed to be trying to do the same thing. The cause of freedom is being challenged throughout the world today by the forces of imperialistic communism. And what in May 1950, for the, for the first time, President Truman authorized direct U.S. aid for the French war in Indochina. Ten million dollars, the beginning of an American commitment. They have proved time after time that their talk about peace is only a cloak for imperialism. The U.S. commitment deepened after... That couldn't be more Orwellian. ...after North Korean troops invaded South Korea at the end of June 1950. It was decided on the very weekend of the uh, North Korean attack that we would step up our aid very significantly to the French and to Southeast Asia because we did not know at that point whether or not the Chinese might attempt to move into that area as a part of a general offensive in Asia. By the end of 1950, the United States had given $150 million in aid to the French forces, including planes, tanks, fuel, ammunition, and napalm. Remember, napalm is jelly gasoline. 